As we head into our third summer of the pandemic, new variants are poised to keep COVID-19 circulating in all regions of America as the temperatures get warmer. But nailing down what comes next is becoming a greater challenge as the U.S. makes a bold move, lifting COVID testing requirements for international travelers coming into the country. And as we've seen before, everything can change in a matter of weeks. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on, we have a very special guest tonight. Former Nebraska Senator Kate Bowles is with us. She is currently serving as Nebraska's Director of USDA Rural Development, and we cannot wait to hear her perspective. But first, Dr. Gold, let's start with the latest data on the current threat of COVID-19 here at home and around the world. Well, good evening, and uh, we have much to talk about tonight, so let's get right to the data so we can have your questions and get you some answers as well as to where we are with COVID. As always, we start off with the global map. And what it's showing us uh, is that for the first time in many weeks, uh, it's essentially flat. And what I mean by that is we're now uh, at approximately 535 million confirmed cases, more than half a billion, and just under a half a million cases in the last 24 hours. And we've been going down at about 5 to 7 percent per, per week on a 14-day running average. And the last 14-day running average is plus 1 percent or essentially flat. This is largely due to the Omicron subtypes. And when we look at the worldwide deaths, 6.3 million confirmed deaths, uh, 1,485, again, significantly underestimating the death toll, but up more than 10 percent, actually 12 percent worldwide. So again, a reversal of a very significant trend. When we focus on the United States, we see a continued change in the map. You may recall several weeks ago, the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast and the Pacific Northwest uh, were the most intense coloration, the Great Lakes region and the upper Midwest. But now we're seeing more deep orange, amber, and even shades of dark red uh, in the southwestern part of the United States, uh, in the Rocky Mountain region, and of course, uh, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, uh, the southern tip of Texas, and the southern tip of the state of Florida. When we look at some of the numbers, uh, you can see uh, we're down as a nation approximately 6% over the last 14-day running average, but we've been staying over 100,000 cases per day uh, for pretty much uh, the last several weeks. And as the chart shows, it's pretty flat in that region, about 13% test positivity. Hospitalization, interestingly, over the same 14-day period is up 10% to just under 30,000 Americans are hospitalized and about 3,200 or about 10 or 12% are in intensive care units. Now, interestingly, a year ago, about 35 or 40% would have been intensive care units. So that shows you that even though we still have hospitalization numbers at a significant level, uh, the uh, severity of illness is somewhat better. And then reassuringly, the number of deaths, although unfortunately over a million uh, recorded in the United States, uh, 331 down about 11 percent. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail. If you look at our case run chart, you can see since the beginning of the pandemic, we're nowhere near as high as we were at the Delta peak uh, or at the uh, Omicron peak but we're still uh, ticking along at somewhere approximately 100,000 cases uh, uh, per day, or 31 cases per 100,000 American population per day. But if you look at Hawaii, two and a half times that, Alaska, Florida, Colorado, New Mexico, uh, one and a half to twice, roughly, uh, the U.S. average. And if we look at some of the smaller communities uh, in the United States, we look at Los Alamos, New Mexico, uh, or Teton, Wyoming, uh, you can see numbers that are significantly higher 
uh, than the U.S. average of 31 cases per 100,000 per day. Again, small numbers, but in these small communities, our farming and ranching communities across the United States, these cases still continue to catch on like wildfire. They spread in our schools and our daycare centers. They spread in our churches. Uh, they spread at social and athletic events. And before you know it, you have some very high case transmission, which unfortunately still results in significant rural hospitalization. When we look at our wastewater numbers, you see that they're pretty flat and we still have a significant percentage of the total uh, wastewater viral counts in the 40 to 80 percent range of the maximum number. Now, the very highest numbers are actually down 15 percent, but we've been, again, just like the case numbers have plateaued, the wastewater numbers of viral counts have also plateaued, indicating that this is likely to stay at this stable case rate uh, for some period of time, at least another 14 days. You know, when we look at the variants that we're seeing transmitted, we'll look at the chart in just a second, uh, we're predominantly now dealing uh, with the BA5 subtype of Omicron, and that is the most transmissible. It is at least as transmissible as measles virus disease, if not more so. And as a result of that, it has outcompeted all of the other uh, variants. If we look at this chart, you can see uh, uh, in the salmon colored bars on the bottom, that is the BA5 subtype. It is rapidly replacing the BA2 and the BA2.12.1. Uh, 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 if you look across the United States, you can see that some parts of our nation are more heavily infected with one subtype or the other, but eventually the most transmissible subtype wins out. You know, it's a competition if you think of it from the perspective of the virus. And the more infectious it is, the faster it's going to replace the other subtypes, the higher the rates of infection are going to be. Again, if we look at hospitalization rates, you can see that they're definitely up over the last several weeks, but intensive care unit rates uh, are down. And the rising hospitalization rates, of course, are a later indicator of the rising uh, case rates. If we look across the U.S., uh, you can see that we're hovering at approximately nine hospitalizations per 100,000 per day, or just under 30,000 Americans hospitalized. But Washington, D.C., Delaware uh, are approximately twice the U.S. average. Hawaii, Florida, Nevada, approximately uh, one and a half times the U.S. average uh, uh, at this time. And of course, the U.S. map looks a lot more favorable than it did in January and February, but there are still hot spots, particularly in small rural communities, critical access hospitals and smaller community hospitals that are seeing increased case rates of hospitalization. If we look at the case fatality rates or the death rates, they have also plateaued, again, nowhere near as high as the Delta peak or the Omicron peak, because we've gotten much better at not only preventing these diseases, through vaccination uh, and through other means, but we've gotten much better at treating these diseases with both oral and intravenous medication, resulting in less hospitalization and less death. But we can't seem to get below that 300 number uh, per day, which has unfortunately taken us well over a million. The U.S. average is uh, 0 0.1 Americans per 100,000 hospitalized well, well below the Omicron peak. But if you look at the state of New Mexico, uh, or even if you look at my home state of Nebraska uh, or Maine, we're about two to three times the U.S. average. New Hampshire and West Virginia are approximately twice. So there are still hot spots of case fatality uh, that does occur, unfortunately. Uh, and we're confronting that. Therefore, earlier treatment, uh, effective treatment is the name of the game. You know, uh, since the last week, Christine, I've had a lot of questions about monkeypox. Well, uh, actually, one of the more common questions is actually where did the name come from? So it turns out in the late 1950s, a series of laboratory monkeys, research monkeys, got infected with the disease, and it was named at that time. But it wasn't until the early 70s that the first human cases were reported. 
So we're over 1,300 cases. As a matter of fact, I just checked before the show, we're over 1,400 confirmed cases in 31 countries worldwide. And we're running about 50 to 55 cases in the United States, about one and a half times that uh, in Canada. The largest number are still in the United Kingdom where they have over 400 cases. But we're tracking this extremely carefully because this is also a highly communicable disease uh, and results in uh, long incubation periods and uh, frankly has got a higher case fatality rate, at least historically, than what we've been dealing with with COVID and certainly uh, much higher than what we've been dealing with uh, with uh, influenza. I also get quite a few questions during the week about the avian flu, and this is a chart looking at the bird flu uh, outbreak uh, across our nation. Uh, in the red dots, you're seeing the commercial sites. Uh, in the blue, in the green dots, you're seeing the wild birds, uh, and uh, the pattern is very much the same. Uh, the numbers have stabilized. Uh, given the season of the year and the migration patterns, but we're still seeing a good deal of it, which has resulted in uh, uh, both an infectious disease uh, impact as well as, of course, an economic impact uh, on the commercial sector. Fortunately, we have not seen another human case spread in the U.S. Uh, recently, certainly in the last week, which is the good news. The bad news is it still does affect our poultry uh, industry. Just a couple words uh, and a couple graphics about vaccination status. Uh, as a nation, 78% uh, some vaccine, 67% fully vaxxed. These numbers have changed very little, uh, and 31% boosted. Now, you know, compare that boost rate to the United Kingdom, compare it to the Netherlands, to Belgium, to France, to Spain. Uh, they're running between uh, 75 and 85% boosted. Uh, and so we're considerably less than that. And, you know, that does underlie a good deal of the case transmission that we're seeing, particularly in the farming and ranching communities uh, of our nation. And then finally, uh, just a look at the run chart on vaccine status here. You know, we started off a uh, little over a year ago and we were at about three and a half million uh, vaccine doses being administered per day. We're down to less than 10 percent of that, 281,000. And a lot of that, of course, is individuals that are eligible for being boosted that have chosen this time to get boosted. So why don't we go to some questions, Christina? Uh, we have other graphics, but we can share them later. Okay, looking forward to those additional graphics. Let's get that number up on the screen because this is your opportunity to call in with any question that you might have tonight for Dr. Gold. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Our phone lines are open now. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, Dr. Gold, just days ago, the Biden administration lifted its negative test requirement for international travelers boarding a flight to the U.S., that was one of the last remaining government mandates designed to contain the spread of COVID. You just showed us that international transmission map. I saw Australia. How concerned are you about the new strains coming in? Well, I think the reason that this decision was made is that the overwhelming majority of transmission in our nation right now is community acquired transmission and not travel related. That's transmission that occurs uh, from going out to a restaurant with others, uh, going to church, uh, going to a school event or an athletic event, uh, etc., and not due to travel. Now, having said that, that's because the variants have been rather stable uh, for some period of time. You know, I can only hope that if we were to see a new, either more infectious or higher severity variant in other parts of the world, we might want to rethink some of those testing requirements. Okay. The highest hope that we can and should have now, of course, is getting people vaxxed and getting people boosted. That will protect them from anything that's coming from other countries. I think that there is a little bit of unease out there, especially amongst the vulnerable population, because we are basically opening up our borders again, letting people come right in. And I think there's a lot of question marks, some uncertainty as well as to what's going to happen going forward. So that's why we're so grateful to have you with us each and every week. Another development 
18 million babies, toddlers, and preschoolers under the age of five, they are the only group not yet eligible for COVID vaccinations in the U.S. But just yesterday, federal health officials said that kid-sized doses of Pfizer's vaccine appear to be safe and effective. So, Dr. Gold, how soon could that vaccine become available to our youngest Americans? You know, Christina, I'm hoping it's going to be very soon uh, with approval uh, in the upcoming weeks, possibly even later this week or mid next week. Uh, it's going to be critically important for several reasons. One, of course, we don't want these kitties uh, to get infected. Uh, not only does it make them sick and, uh, and potentially give them the risk of long COVID or post COVID syndrome, which we know can be really disabling in terms of cardiac function, lung function, uh, you know, what, what adults would call brain fog, but the toddlers would probably just be confused. It might have some developmental delay issues as well. But very importantly also, when these kiddos get sick, uh, they can't go to daycare. They, they can't go to play groups and things of that nature, or at least they shouldn't. And that, of course, means that mom or dad or both uh, can't go to work <clears throat> or can't do other things because they're now being re-exposed. And with higher and higher reinfection rates that we're seeing, even for people that were either previously infected or fully vaxxed, uh, that becomes a critical concern. So we're going to be really advocating very strongly. I know that the administration has already done some planning with the CDC to pre-position these vaccine doses widely across the United States. Now understand it's a two dose sequence for the Moderna and a three dose sequence for the Pfizer. And that's because these are low doses so that they have little or minimal reactions of the kiddos. And yet you get to vaccine efficacy rates of 80 to 90%. You know, that's pretty uh, effective. Uh, and so I'm hoping that we'll get some good news uh, from the Food and Drug Administration and then from the ACIP uh, in literally days to maybe two weeks. Wow. You know, just like you showed us moments ago with your maps, the recent uptick in case numbers is due to at least four highly infectious subvariants of Omicron. But I understand that there are Omicron specific vaccines currently in development by both Pfizer and Moderna. That's exciting. Any word on how long it will be before they become available? And is this something that we should actually wait for instead of getting a boost right now? Well, let's talk about the timing for a few minutes and then we can uh, talk about whether people should get boosted uh, at, at the moment. Uh, so uh, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, enhanced products as they're being referred to uh, have multiple different and important characteristics, not the least of which uh, is the the ability to identify multiple sites on the virus uh, that they can be active against, and also to have specific activity against some of the Omicron variants, which of course is 99% of what we're seeing uh, in the United States and 99% of what we're seeing worldwide. Now, clearly this will not be the last variant we will see, but it'll every future variant will look a lot more like Omicron than it did like anything uh, previously, without a doubt. Now, in terms of, and, and they, and you know, people are talking, you know, uh, there's nothing official, but that the end of the summer, you know, sort of late August or early September, uh, people have been talking about possibly combining this boost of this new enhanced uh, vaccine with a flu shot, you know, all to be determined, but just to make it easy for you and I to get our flu immunization and an enhanced COVID immunization as well. As far as individuals who are now, of course, we're talking adults and children over five, uh, in terms of the timing of getting a boost, uh, if they're eligible now, a lot of that is going to be a very personal decision that individuals will need to make with their healthcare professionals. Certainly, anybody over the age of 50, anybody uh, over uh, that age or under that age uh, that has the comorbidities of heart disease or lung disease uh, or have being treated for cancers, had a transplant, you know, in that otherwise high risk group, you know, uh, diabetes, for instance, uh, getting that boost when you're eligible, uh, understanding that there likely be an enhanced boost sometime in the fall is still a wise idea. 
And that's what we are advocating broadly. However, it's a very personal decision that an individual will need to make with their trusted health care professional. All right. We are going to go to the phones. Robert from Missouri joins us tonight. Go right ahead, Robert. Robert, are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Oh, thanks for being with us. Go right ahead with your question, sir. Uh, my question is, um, of the three vaccines uh, that are available right now, how are they rated per vaccine for effectiveness for a 9 to 12 month period of time after vaccination? Well, Robert, the, uh, the data, the only data that I'm aware of uh, is comes from the uh, derivatives of what are called the mix and match trial. Uh, there's been some data uh, that has looked at which compared all of them. There is some data from some studies that were done in Israel and in the United Kingdom. But the long and the short of it uh, is that the Moderna and Pfizer products uh, seem to have the longest durability when used as a boost. Uh, and it's a little bit variable by age. The older you are, the shorter the time that you'll get the benefit of the boost. Now, but this is based not so much on reinfection rates as it is based on antibody levels. And antibody levels are a pretty good marker of your immunity in mind, but they're not exactly the same as reinfection rates. But what we do know is that reinfection rates do rise. They start to rise three to six months after your boost, and then uh, will continue to show higher rates of reinfection, even uh, with uh, the Omicron strains uh, that we're now seeing. So for all of those reasons, that's why the Food and Drug Administration has chosen approximately uh, a five-month window. But again, uh, this is a decision uh, that you will need to make with your trusted healthcare professional, depending on your age, depending on your you know, other medical conditions, what meds you may take, uh, et cetera. All right. Thank you so much for that question, Robert. Our phone lines are lighting up, so I want to try to get Sam from Montana in before we hit the break. Sam, thank you for joining us. Go right ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you for taking my call. And I, I think you may have answered my question al already, but uh, my wife and I are, are in our early 70s, and we've had the two uh, shots with uh, Moderna, and then we had the booster six months later. And do you think it's worth getting the second booster or versus any risk that may be with a, a second booster? Do you recommend going ahead and getting that? Thank you. Well, thanks for your question, Sam. It's one that we do get an awful lot of. And the current recommendations from the CDC is that if you're more than five months out in your age group, uh, that you should uh, get boosted, particularly if you're on any medications that might weaken your immune system or have any of the you know classic medical conditions that we've been talking about. Uh, there is little question in my mind that these enhanced uh, or modified boosts will be available, uh, hopefully, uh, in the fall. But the current recommendations are, given the reinfection rates that we're seeing with these Omicron variants, and, you know, these reinfection rates are not trivial in terms of the resulting hospitalization, but they're also not trivial in terms of the instance of long COVID. And the long COVID syndromes that we've been seeing uh, are quite severe. And, you know, depending on your age group, uh, are, you know, on average about 23 to 25 percent of everybody that gets COVID. You know, we've had over 80 million confirmed cases in the United States. You know, if one out of four of them are going to get long COVID, that's 20 million people. And we've probably underestimated the total cases by a half. So, I mean, if you think about it, that's 40 million people that are going to be subject to long term loss of taste and smell, brain fog, cardiac symptoms, pulmonary symptoms, blood clots, renal insufficiency, et cetera. So for all those reasons, given the fact that these vaccines are extremely uh, low risk, particularly given the fact you've been successfully vaxxed and boosted once, uh, our recommendation would be to go ahead and, and get your uh, eligible boost. 
All right. Thank you so much for that call, Sam. We appreciate it. That leaves a line open for you tonight. Call in and join our conversation. The number is 877-731-6733. And stay with us because when we come back, former Senator Kate Bowles, who is currently serving as the Nebraska Director of USDA Rural Development, she's going to join our conversation. We'll be right back. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We are glad you're with us. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome former Nebraska Senator Kate Bowles, who is currently serving as Nebraska's Director of USDA Rural Development. Now, she was appointed by the President to oversee the administration of rural development programs in the state, including grants and loans. And she is a proud sixth generation Nebraskan who grew up on her family's farm. Welcome, Senator Bowles. We're so excited that you're with us. Let's start with some background on USDA rural development for those who may be unfamiliar. Sure thing. USDA rural development is your partner and a catalyst in community success. We want to invest in the things that make your hometown feel special. So whether that is a community center, a hospital, or a new fire hall, we're here with grants, loans, technical assistance, and other support to make you successful. Wow. You know, we really need to celebrate our small towns. And what's so great about living in rural America is the community is usually rather tight. You usually know the neighbors surrounding you in the local grocery store, for example. So I love what you're doing. Now, we've talked with Dr. Gold several times about healthcare workforce and access to healthcare in rural communities. Do you happen to have any initiatives that help address these concerns? Absolutely. And you're exactly right. Healthcare and access to healthcare is a top priority for rural America. Our community facilities program can help invest through grants and loans in a variety of healthcare related projects. That can include hospitals, it can include assisted living facilities or clinics, and importantly, it can include emergency healthcare equipment. We know that a lot of folks uh, are volunteers in our rural communities providing that emergency health care, and we can provide the equipment and the tools to make them more successful. So we're glad to be your partner, and we're happy to meet community needs. You know what's awesome is that there are actually people joining us tonight living in rural America who are not aware of what you have available. So, Senator Bowles, when we talk about loans and grants to help expand economic opportunities and improve the quality of life, what kinds of projects are you working with and how can our viewers actually learn more about what you do? Sure. We're your partner in whatever dream your community has. Our projects really fall into three major categories. We provide grants, loans, and technical assistance for businesses, for uh, people who need housing, and for communities. So for businesses, we can provide expansion loans or marketing loans and grants. Um, for communities, we can invest in facilities like fire halls or even streets and emergency sirens. Um, and for housing, we can help people who might otherwise have difficulty affording a home make that first home purchase um, and really put down roots in those small communities. We're here not just to help you with the resources, but to also help you with the process. Um, we know that folks don't always uh, want to start in on uh, filling out the paperwork that's necessary to qualify for these grants and loans. But we're your partner, and we promise to work side by side with you to get your project across the finish line. I love that. So if somebody has a question as they're trying to get that paperwork completed, they can reach out to you and get some assistance. That's almost unheard of this day and age. So it's great to hear what you're doing. We look forward to hearing more of your perspective throughout the show. We're going to go back to the phones. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. Christina joins us from Nevada this evening. Thanks for joining us, Christina. Go right ahead. Hi. Uh, yes, I was calling because I finally was able to get the uh, two COVID shots, and then I got the booster. But before I was able to do that, I kept getting the shingles, and I've had the shingles on and off for over a year. And uh, finally I got one shingle shot and after I got it, the shingles came back. So I haven't been able to get the, whether the second booster and I haven't been able to get the second shingle shot. 
So I was wondering why or what is it that's causing it to reoccur so often, and even after having the shot. Yeah, Christina, uh, unfortunately, a small percentage of individuals uh, who are either not either not vaccinated or partially vaccinated for shingles uh, will actually get a symptomatic case uh, of shingles. And of course, the audience knows uh, that shingles is not a terribly pleasant disease. It's associated with a rash. It's a late sequelae of chickenpox, uh, uh, unfortunately, and it's it's fairly common. Uh, you know, it could just be the roll of the dice and bad luck, or it could be something else about either other medications you're taking or something going on uh, with your immune system. It would be a great idea uh, for you to give a call to your local healthcare professional and just be sure that they know that you're having this recurring uh, episodes of shingles because there may be some testing that uh, they may want to do uh, or perhaps uh, accelerate uh, another round of vaccination uh, when you're eligible for it. But that's, some, that's unusual enough a story that it's worth bringing to your attention of your healthcare professional team. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Christina. That leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. We're going to go back to the phones. Karen joins us this evening from Florida. Thanks for joining us, Karen. Go right ahead. Hi there. This uh, this phone call is for Dr. Gold. Uh, Dr. Gold, I'm wondering, with the Omicron being the dominant variant now, I was wondering what you're seeing in regard to the long haul effects at this time compared to the earlier versions, um, you know, because we've now had the Omicron for, what, five months or so or more. And, and are the effects, uh, the long haul, are they as severe as the earlier versions? You know, Karen, that is a great question because a lot of the early work done uh, in the terms of the research on uh, the long or post-COVID syndrome uh, was uh, initially after Delta, uh, where there were very large numbers. However, the data that we're now seeing from Omicron seem to be unchanged. That is to say, uh, on average, uh, I think there's about a 23 to 25 percent incidence uh, in large, large studies, and these are coming uh, from Europe, from Israel, and of course from the United States as well. The severity seems to be the same. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of what we call cognitive uh, issues. We're still seeing anxiety uh, and depression, and hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about the mental health sequelae of COVID in a few minutes. But we're also seeing a good deal of cardiac symptoms uh, which you can uh, detect on cardiac scans, but patients would rep report shortness of breath and chest pain uh, and exercise intolerance, uh, a good deal of issues uh, related to new onset or increasing severity of diabetes. So unfortunately, the uh, Omicron infections have not been more forgiving uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, long COVID. Now, having said all of that, you know, now that we're in the most recent subtype, the BA5 subtype and the end stages of the BA2 subtype, it's possible as we continue to follow what individuals come back to our clinics with, uh, that that will change. And that perhaps as these variants have become more transmissible, the instance of long COVID, post-COVID syndrome uh, will go down. But only time and good science and clinical trials will uh, give us that information. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Karen. We're going to go back to the phones in just a moment. I wanted to bring Senator Bowles back into the conversation because, as you know, Senator Bowles, living in rural America, it can be very difficult to get the health care that you need nearby. Many have to travel for sometimes an hour, two to three hours in some cases so let's talk about what you do and how it relates to rural health care. How is expansion to high-speed broadband or other telecommunications infrastructure crucial to our rural areas in terms of expanding the economy and keeping people living in our rural areas? 
Sure. You know, one of the positive things that has come out of our experiences, our collective experiences with COVID-19 is a new openness and a new awareness and a new comfort level with telemedicine and with distance learning. So those broadband projects are so essential to taking our rural healthcare providers to the next level, whether it's being able to uh, consult with a practitioner in another community, or it's the availability to get something like um, a healthcare consultation via telemedicine, we can really um, improve the quality quality of care uh, if we have the broadband that we need, which is one of the reasons I'm so proud to be a part of USDA rural development. Our rural utility services is there um, working with rural communities, making sure that we are expanding broadband access as quickly as those communities are ready to put it in. You know, I love what you're doing. You are a beloved senator. Your constituents loved you. How did you get this job, though? Is this something that you wanted to do or did the administration approach you and say this is something that they think that you would be good at? How did you end up where you are now? Well, I, I love rural America. Uh, I'm a Nebraska farm kid through and through. I'm really proud to be a part of a 150 year farm family on my mother's side. Um, so I am so pleased that the administration um, has given me the opportunity to bring that passion for rural America together with my skills um, as a local elected official um, to do exactly what we're we're all trying to do here at USDA Rural uh, rural Development, which is um, improve quality of life for rural Americans um, and make hometowns even stronger. Um, so I'm I'm pleased that I've been op this door has been open for me, and I'm really proud to be a part of the Biden Harris administration. Now, would you say that this job has actually helped you learn more about other rural parts of the country? Are different rural parts of the country? I mean, how are they similar? How are wh where can you really lend what you've learned? in Nebraska and expand it out to the entire country, because I think that we need more officials who are really very close to rural America in order to perfect it, to bring more people there. Certainly rural America has its own unique set of strengths and challenges. Um, I think you'll find some of the most hardworking, um, committed and close knit communities um, in the world right here in Nebraska. Nebraska and in rural America. But one of the things that the Biden Harris administration especially brings to this work is a commitment to diversity, equality, and inclusion. Um, our administration is really working hard to make sure that communities that previously were not fully served by federal programs have that opportunity opportunity. So whether it's making extra efforts to partner with our tribal nations, or whether it's reaching out to uh, Latinx communities that speak a different language than the, the traditional English language, or whether that's making sure we make our materials representative so that minority farmers and ranchers know that they're a part of our story. Um, that's really something that's essential to the Biden and Harris, Harris administration's ethic here. Um, and it's something that we um, we bring a new framework uh, to rural development by making sure we're as inclusive as possible. I love it. There is a lot of diversity across rural America. And those of us who go out there, who actually put boots on the ground and travel rural America, we know that. So I love hearing you say that. It's really great to get your perspective tonight. We're going to go back to the phones. Brenda of Nevada joins us this evening. Thanks for joining us, Brenda. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, I've heard that some people who took Paxlovid for COVID recover, and then two to eight days after they've recovered, they get sick with COVID again, and sometimes even more ill than the first time. Should those people who have taken oral medication isolate for another 10 days after they feel they have recovered, uh, feel that they have recovered to see if COVID does come back? So, Brenda, there are two parts of your question. First of all, of course, thank you for uh, calling in. Uh, so this uh, so-called Paxlovid rebound uh, has been reported uh, fairly commonly. And it's usually described as people test positive for COVID, they're feeling lousy, they start the medication within hours, or at least by the next day, they're feeling dramatically better. Somebody told me, one of my friends, that they thought they could run a marathon after their first or second dose of, uh, of Paxlovid. They take the five-day course of it. 
and then within two to three days, and it's about 20% roughly, uh, will start to develop some symptoms. And one of two things happens. You either ride it out over a period of time and it tends to you know, dissipate, uh, particularly if it's not severe, or if the symptoms are considerable, what some people have done is they've called their local healthcare professional and they've gotten another prescription for another five days of Paxlovid. Indeed, at some time, at one time, there was some consideration uh, that the manufacturer, Pfizer, would uh, would actually convert Paxlovid from a five day to a ten day regimen. So the the current uh, thinking now is to leave it individualized and to uh, allow the patient, just because the majority of people who take Paxlovid uh, get their five-day course uh, and recover well, and that's sort of the end of their COVID. Uh, it turns out, interestingly, that if you are treated with a course of uh, Paxlovid, uh, that your likelihood of developing long COVID, you know, post-COVID syndrome, is actually lower. And it's also uh, favorable if you start the course earlier, that is to say, you have less of a chance of rebound and you have a less of a chance of, of post-COVID syndrome. So again, early testing, early diagnosis, early treatment. Now, in terms of the second part of your question is how infectious are you? If you're symptomatic after a full five-day course of Paxlovid, that would be a good time to get retested. You know, it can be a rapid test, you know, a home test, or more accurately, a PCR test, a saliva test. However, either way, uh, if you're symptomatic, you, you would want to get retested before you go back to work, go back to school, uh, et cetera. So I hope that helps. Uh, again, uh, we continue to learn more about the efficacy of these drugs, and there are several other new drugs that are being developed as well. But uh, these are major breakthroughs, you know, home, uh, easily available, very effective, low side effects. All right. Thank you so much for that call. That leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. We're going to go back to the phones on the other side of the break. Stay with us. You're watching Rural Health Matters only on RFD-TV, Rural America's most important network. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We are getting so many great calls tonight. Keep those coming in. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and Senator Kate Bowles, the Nebraska Director of USDA Rural Development, is our special guest. We are going to go back to the phones in just a moment, but I did want to ask you, Senator Bowles, how has COVID-19 affected some of the projects that you've been working on or helping out with? COVID-19 has impacted every community everywhere. And just like other parts of America, rural America has experienced slowdowns, but also um, increased demands. So we've seen more interest than ever in some of our community projects, um, like interest in building health clinics, like interest in making sure that rural communities have access to equipment to respond to healthcare needs. So one of the things that I think is very special about USDA rural development is that we're one of the rare branches of government that has local offices available for all of you. Um, in Nebraska, we've got offices from Scotts Bluff to Norfolk to Car Kearney and everywhere in between. So I really encourage folks who are experiencing those impacts, whether it's demand for additional health care or um, increased needs in your community to reach out to one of our local offices and let us lend a hand. You know, you get a chance to see how significant what Dr. Gold is doing at UNMC is firsthand because you're right there in Nebraska. But there's so many of our viewers sprawling all across this great country. They don't realize, I'm sure, because it's hard to, that there is such a gem lying right in the middle of the country. If you can, let our audience know just how profound the work that Dr. Gold is doing at UNMC actually is. We are all so proud of not only Dr. Gold, but all of the hardworking healthcare professionals that work at UNMC. Um, we knew back when uh, they had such an incredible and compassionate response to folks who were impacted by Ebola, um, that we had expertise um, and high quality care 
to respond to serious healthcare initiatives um, right here in the heartland. Um, UNMC has provided such incredible leadership in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, not only have we seen them successfully respond and provide care, we've seen them take that to the next level and really become a leader in this field. So we can't wait to see what Dr. Gold and his team do next. Oh, for both of you, I'm just grateful for the foundation that you're laying out for my kids and my grandkids and their kids and the generations to come because you're not just looking out for what's happening right now. You're thinking of the future. You're thinking about what rural America will look like in the future. So thank you to both for what you're doing there. We're going to go back you to know, the phones. For I, oh, I Dr. Gold. That, that this is a team effort and uh, there's no I in the word team. Uh, we have a unique group of clinicians, of researchers, of educators that are really focused on the health and health care and well-being of the communities that we serve. And we've leaned in to professional athletics, to collegiate athletics, to the meatpacking industries, uh, to the court systems, et cetera, uh, when they needed help. And it's been a great honor to do so. But again, there's no I in the word team. Well, there is an eye in implications, which is what I think about for the rest of the country based on the model that you're building at UNMC. And so you keep doing what you're doing and hopefully everybody else will catch on. And Dr. Gold, we know how special you are. You don't have to tell us. Virginia of Ohio joins the conversation next. Thanks for joining us, Virginia. Go right ahead. Hi, um, I got my second booster. And afterwards, it's the only one I got that I actually got a reaction. Um, I was actually felt really sick for about three days. I didn't have any energy, and I was just, I don't know, it just seemed like I, it was drug out for about a week. I had uh, seen one of my uh, doctors after that, and the nurse had checked me in. I had commented on that, and she said she had heard that from several different people, people and that she had also heard that after the second booster, that a lot of the people uh, were getting their immune system was getting weaker versus stronger from this. It, you know, it just kind of made me wonder if, you know, why the, I got this reaction, if other people are too. I'd like your opinion on that. Sure. Well, Virginia, the experience has been sort of uh, very, very valuable all over the map, so to speak. There are some people with their second boost, they have a reaction, a systemic reaction, which it sounds like uh, you did and, and had little or none after their first boost. Others, it's just the other way around. Their first boost caused them to get fever and headachey and feel a bit lethargic for a few days, certainly sore in the arm. And then on the second boost, they had little or nothing. Uh, in terms of the uh, ability of your immune system to be strengthened, by additional boosters. There is no question that when you have a reaction, that's a sign of your immune system getting revved up, not getting revved down. And so uh, you can interpret that as the fact that the booster had an effect and it will give you more protection against hospitalization and of course uh, infection or reinfection if you previously had COVID. You know, the asterisk to that, of course, is that everybody's different and everybody's immune system is different depending upon how old you are and whether you take other medications and so many other uh, different factors. Uh, certainly, when it comes time for another booster recommendation, which likely will occur this fall, as we've been talking about, that would be a good time uh, to talk to your healthcare professional uh, and say, you know, listen, uh, you know, I had such and such a mild or minimal reaction to the first boost. I had a more significant reaction to the second. Does that determine uh, which of the subsequent uh, enhanced boosters I'm, I should get, when I should get it, or possibly even more importantly, where you should get it? So for instance, you might choose not to get it in a pharmacy. You might choose to get it in a physician's office or in a clinic where there are more people around in case you do have a, a reaction to it. But uh, in terms of what we're seeing uh, across the country, uh, we're seeing minimal reactions to the second boost and a good deal of protection from reinfection, breakthrough infections, uh, et cetera. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Virginia. Next, we're going to the Four Corners states. Jimmy from New Mexico joins us. Thanks for joining us. Jimmy, go right ahead. Well, howdy. 
Uh, I didn't have a question pertaining to COVID or anything, although I've had COVID and pneumonia, and I did just fine with no any, uh, anything at all after. And so I'm I'm just really thrilled about that. But uh, up to the nurses and doctors and so on, I started when the pandemonium started to make uh, to get three bottles and paint them red, white, and blue, generally beer bottles, they're easy to find. And uh, glue them together and wrap them with twine and glue that together. And then I put the appropriate red, white, and blue flowers in them. And I've managed to finally, after a little, nearly two years, I got into the Veterans Hospital with them. And I also got into Veterans Reintegration Center with them. And I've given them to the state police, 70 when one of their supervisors was shot. And the APD officers had four down and shot at one time. And I started giving them to them. And I've gone to all the fire departments in my area, south of Albuquerque, and police departments and sheriff departments and everything. And uh, just uh, it's just a token to let people know that uh, somebody out here does care. And I just have that. Uh, I've been doing it, and I'm still doing it, and I'll just keep on doing it, I guess. I'm only 91 and a half, <laughs> but... Uh, that's what I wanted to call about was to let you know that somebody out here gives a hoot about the doctors and nurses and everybody that's burdened with that kind of, a, you know, the situation we have. So I know if you didn't care, you'd run away. <laughs> and you need to know that somebody out here cares. And that's what I had to say. I always so make crosses. I make crosses out of grocery cans with uh, leave the labels on. The gist of the story is to be thankful for your food and pray for the farmers. And, you know, the, just what we are all about. And I make other crosses, and I left a bunch of them at the Veterans Hospital and so forth and so on. So that's, that's all I had to say about that. But, uh. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for calling. You know, this is a good opportunity uh, to remind our audience to do just what you do. In a sense, what you're doing is saying thank you. You're providing some uplifting reminders of how proud we are to be Americans. And you're, you're showing grace. Uh, and, you know, it's great somebody your age, you know, uh, ha had a bout with COVID and recovered so successfully. I strongly recommend that you get vaxxed and boosted when your eligibility comes, given your age, so you can keep doing what you're doing to support those that have served our nation, worn a cloth of America, and to support those who have been delivering health care. You know, they are tired, they are frustrated, fatigued, et cetera, and yet they keep coming to work every day, working hard and taking care of those that are sick, and not just with COVID, but with all of the heart disease and cancer and all of the strokes and all of the uh, Parkinson's and so many other things that plague our nation and plague our older population. And so thank you. Thank you so much for what you do. Wow, Jimmy, truly the embodiment of the spirit of rural America. God bless you, sir. And Senator, I wanted to give you one more time to share your final thoughts with us. We're so grateful for having you on tonight. Sure. It's been a pleasure. And I just want to remind everyone that we believe in hometown America. We want to help you and your community make your dreams come true. So learn more about USDA rural development at rd.usda.gov. Again, that's rd.usda.gov. We'd love to hear from you. Oh, thank you so much for joining us for the hard work that you're doing, making our small communities even greater. Dr. Gold, what are your final thoughts for us this evening? Well, first, of course, to uh, thank uh, Senator Bowles. It's been a great pleasure to work with her in the legislature and, of course, in her current role. You know, as we're totally uh, laser focused on rural Nebraska and rural America uh, more broadly. Uh, I guess my uh, closing comments tonight would be just to, for folks to continue to be careful. We are seeing an uptick and we need yes. to find and we will be here for you every Monday night at 5 p.m. only on RFD-TV. Thanks for joining us.